Today on the external solemnity of the Sacred Heart, we'll start with a short review of the Church's teaching about the kingship to Christ in order to put everything into context. Remember, because of original sin, heaven slammed shut. There wasn't a thing any one of us can do about it. Man had absolutely no way to redeem himself. But in the infinite mercy of God, he decided to send down his son on a rescue mission to save his enemies. That's us. So our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ became man and paid our debt by his passion and death upon the cross. And in response to this work, God the Father poured down gifts upon our Lord in his sacred humanity. And one of the gifts our Lord was given was power. As he says at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel, all power has been given to me. All power, all power in heaven and earth. It's all been given to Christ our Lord. That means that all power passes through Christ and it comes from Christ. Every last speck of power in society, whether it's a kid with his dog or a mother over children or a father over his wife in the home, president over the nation, every last speck of power is Christ's, including all authority. All authority in society, and that's every society, whether it's a family, whether it's a city, a state, or nation, all authority comes from Christ and depends directly upon Him. Since all authority comes from Christ, all authority for every society on earth, then Christ is the true King of all societies. Popes have made this very clear. Pope Leo XIII, quote, His empire, he's talking about Christ our Lord, his empire includes not only Catholic nations, not only baptized persons who, though of right belonging to the church, have been led astray by error or have been cut off from her by schism, but also all those who are outside the Christian faith, so that truly the whole of mankind is subject to the power of Jesus Christ. Close quote, the vicar of Christ. Christ is the king in public and private life. And since he's the king of all nations, and since he's also God, all nations owe him worship. They owe him public worship. And all their authority belongs to him. We have the right to have our Lord's kingship publicly acknowledged. And furthermore, there will be serious consequences if Christ our Lord is not publicly honored as king, all crazy political theories notwithstanding. Pope Pius XI, quote, With God and Jesus Christ excluded from political life, with authority derived not from God but from man, the very basis of that authority has been taken away because the chief reason of the distinction between ruler and subject has been eliminated. The result is that human society is tottering to its fall because it no longer has a secure and solid foundation, close quote, the vicar of Christ. With God and Jesus Christ excluded from political life, human society is tottering to its fall because it no longer has a secure and solid foundation. And if we need any proof of that, all we have to do is look around. Because our Lord is the King of all nations and because He's God, all nations owe Him public worship and all their authority belongs to Him. Now all that's background and that gives us the ability to appreciate the absolute importance of the enthronement of the Sacred Heart. Enthronement is a public recognition of the kingship of Christ over a home over a parish, a diocese, a city, a state, a nation in which he's been enthroned. That enthronement is a solemn public recognition of the worship that is due to Christ and the reality that all their authority flows from him. The late great Father Matteo, who was the apostle of enthronement of the Sacred Heart, commissioned by St. Pius X to go preach this to the whole world. And he did that for all the popes from St. Pius X till his death during the reign of Pope John XXIII. So Father Matteo points out that enthronement is also, quote, an act of social reparation for all the modern refusals to accept his kingship 
as shamelessly flaunted in godless legislation, godless schools, godless families, and may we add all the godless filth that pours out like raw sewage from the outlets of our mass media. Each one of us should enthrone an image, a picture, a statue of the Sacred Heart in the most noble place in our home. And when we're at it, we should get a picture or a statue of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and set it up there next to our Lord. It's a solemn recognition that in that home, our Lord is the King and our Lady is the Queen, and what they say goes. But that's just the beginning. The enthronement is just the beginning. Then we've got to start acting like we really mean it. Because as Father Matteo points out, the very essence of enthronement is to inspire in us a blazing love for the Sacred Heart. One home at a time. One town at a time. One city at a time. One nation at a time. By following a three-point spiritual plan. First point is prayer, especially at home. We need to restore the life of prayer in Catholic families. So start by turning off your TV, or better yet, throw it out the window. Then kneel down and say the family rosary every single night. Our Lady wasn't bored in heaven and wondering what are they doing down in Portugal today when she came down in 1917 to Fatima with a message for the world. Are we smarter than Our Lady? Are we smarter than God? If God went to the trouble of sending His mother down to tell us that we should pray the rosary, then who are we to not listen up? So the first point of the spiritual plan is prayer. Second point, Holy Communion. We need to strive to hear Mass and make worthy communions as often as possible. By doing this, our home becomes filled with the strength and power of our Lord dwelling in our hearts. The enthroned image is an expression of his kingly rule over society. And these communions then firmly establish and maintain his kingly rule over our hearts. What if we can't get to Mass? Then we send our holy angel to Mass. We make a spiritual communion. There's a whole section on that in this book, Jesus, Our Eucharistic Love. The second point of the plan, the spiritual plan, is Holy Communion. Third point, penance. That's the cross. The cross. Father Matteo, now listen carefully. This is important. It's a long quote, but it's important. Quote, All of us have some sorrow, some bit of the cross offered us by Christ. This must be put to use, not merely to be endured and not merely to be suffered for one's own sake, but to be suffered as a sacrifice for the conversion of some soul. Is there a sinner to be converted? a fallen away Catholic to be returned to the fold, an unbeliever to be made a Christian. The conversion is guaranteed if only sufficient ransom is paid. Let me repeat that. The conversion is guaranteed if only sufficient ransom is paid. If it is necessary to work a miracle to perform this, the miracle shall be performed. A miracle of grace. But always these miracles of conversion must be paid for. How? First, by Holy Mass, by living the Mass in our daily lives, by offering up oneself with Christ in the chalice. Secondly, by the spirit of penance just described, daily cross is accepted in a spirit of sacrifice. Thirdly, by a special kind of sacrifice. This is only for the chosen few who wish to do something extraordinary to honor the Sacred Heart and to ransom souls. It is known as night adoration in the home. This part of the program calls for more fervent souls to spend one hour, at least once a month, in adoration of the King of Love in their home, either as individuals or as a family group. This hour is to be made sometime between 9 in the evening and 6 in the morning. The time is chosen to compensate and make reparation for the sins of the world so frequently committed during the same time. Close quote, Father Matteo. Let's review that little section. A conversion of a sinner is guaranteed if only sufficient ransom is paid. How do we pay it? First, by offering ourselves up at Holy Mass with Christ in the chalice. Secondly, by accepting our daily crosses with the spirit of sacrifice. And thirdly, by the little flock who make night adoration in the home for at least one hour a month between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. So three points of the spiritual prayer are, uh, plan are prayer, especially the family rosary, 
Holy Communion as frequently as possible, and penance, paying the price for sinners. Think of what Our Lady of Fatima pointed out. There are many souls that go to hell because no one prays and offers sacrifice for them. Here's how to do it. If we were on our way to hell, wouldn't we want someone to do this for us? Okay. Why do we want to do this? Because our Lord is not only king of the nations, he rules our households. We love him, we want to acknowledge his kingship and express our thanksgiving to him. And if we do that, he's promised to reward us. If we follow this plan, these promises that he's given are guaranteed. These are promises made by God who can neither deceive nor be deceived. God isn't like us. When he promises something, it's going to happen. I mean, we might weasel. This is God. These are promises from God. Okay, we'll go through them. I'll make comments on the way. The 12 promises of our blessed Lord to St. Margaret Mary for those who are devoted to his sacred heart. First promise, I will give them all the graces necessary for their state in life. He'll give us all the graces necessary for our state in life. What more do we need? We're here to get to heaven. The only possible way to get to heaven is by means of grace. And the very first promise our Lord makes to those who are devoted to sacred heart is to give them all the graces necessary. Think about it. All the graces. Second promise, I will give them peace in their families. Well, since he's the only one here present that can claim he came from the Holy Family, the rest of us can probably take advantage of this promise. Third promise, I will console them in all their troubles. He doesn't promise that we won't have troubles. The cross is part of our life. He's God, he's perfect, and he had to undergo the cross. We're kidding ourselves if we think we won't have crosses, okay? He doesn't promise we won't have crosses. There's one thing we can be sure of. We're going to have them. He doesn't promise we won't have troubles, but he does promise that he'll console us in all our troubles. Fourth promise. They shall find in my heart an assured refuge during life, and especially at the hour of death. Now, this is great. What happens to us the very moment we die? That's a particular judgment. The very moment we die, which means the very moment that our soul leaves the body, we have to appear before the judgment seat. And who is sitting on the judgment seat judging us? It's Christ our Lord. Our Lord is going to be our judge. And what has he just promised? To give us a sure refuge in his heart at the hour of death. Now, is that mercy or what? He's promised to have mercy on us at the very minute that he's going to judge us. Fifth, I will pour abundant blessings on all their undertakings. Speaks for itself. Sixth, sinners shall find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Why did God become man? To save sinners. Why, after his resurrection, did he keep the wounds? We can see him on the statue there. Why did he keep the wounds, especially that wound in his sacred heart? They're battle scars that he kept to remind us of the love he has for each one of us to remind us that he loves each one of us so much that he died for us. Seven, tepid souls shall become fervent. Another word for tepid is lukewarm. Being lukewarm means that someone commits deliberate, venial sins without even thinking about it or worrying much about it. Oh, well, it's only a venial sin. So what? Why would a promise that tepid souls become fervent be a big deal? St. Gregory the Great explains, quote, The habit of committing light faults without remorse and without an effort to correct them gradually deprives us of the fear of God. And when the fear of God is lost, it is easy to pass from venial to mortal sin, close quote. St. Isidore points out, By a just judgment, the Lord will permit the man who despises minor sins to fall into more grievous crimes, close quote. St. Alphonsus teaches, quote, Many are unwilling to be altogether separated from Jesus Christ. They wish to follow him, but they wish to follow him at a distance, like St. Peter, who, when the Redeemer was seized in the garden, followed him from afar off. But they that act in this manner shall easily fall into the misfortune which befell St. Peter, who, when charged by a servant maid with being a disciple of the Redeemer, denied Jesus Christ. 
three times. Close quote, St. Alphonsus. Are we working at overcoming our own faults? Are we tepid? For years, I've been warned from the pulpit and the bulletin that if we're going to have the Internet, if we're going to have the Internet, we must have some kind of extremely aggressive filter, like American Family Association filter, Family Link, to protect everyone from the bad sites. Have we done that? Do we have any pirated software? If we do, what makes us think we're going to get away with it when we die? What sort of TV shows have we watched? Magazine articles, videos, music, books. Are we doing any unnecessary servile work or shopping on Sundays? Have any modest clothing, entertaining impure thoughts? Are we dating before we're old enough and financially independent enough to be married? Have we been keeping company without a view towards timely marriage? Do we have a rebellious attitude towards authority like our parents, our husband, our boss? Have we overindulged in food and drink? Are we using any blasphemous language? Are we working at overcoming our faults? Do we make good confessions frequently? Our Lord promises that a lukewarm soul who devotes himself to the sacred heart will become fervent. What are we waiting for? Eight, fervent souls shall speedily rise to great perfection. Think about St. Margaret Mary. According to Father Minnelli, quote, It is useless to attempt to describe the saint's burning love for the Eucharist. When she was not able to receive Holy Communion, she broke out in ardent expressions of love like these. I have such a desire for Holy Communion that if I had to walk barefoot along a path of fire to obtain it, I would do so with unspeakable joy. Close quote. Fervent souls shall rise speedily to great perfection. Nine. I will bless the homes in which the image of my sacred heart shall be exposed and honored. Speaks for itself. Ten, I will give to priests the power to touch the most hardened hearts. Now that's particularly important for at least a couple of us around here. St. John Chrysostom points out, quote, Everyone must render an account of his own sins, but priests are also responsible for the sins of others. Close quote. Priests are responsible for the sins of others. Everyone has to render account of their own sins. Priests are responsible for the sins of others. That's why I don't get up here to try to make you all feel good. I want you to be good. I have plans, and hell isn't part of them, okay? Number 11, those who propagate this devotion shall have their name written in my heart, and it shall never be effaced. One speaks for itself, spread the devotion. 12, The all-powerful love of my heart will grant to all those who shall receive communion on the first Friday of nine consecutive months the grace of final repentance. They shall not die under my displeasure, nor without receiving the sacraments. My heart shall be their assured refuge at that last hour. This is the first Friday promise. Let's hear that again. The all-powerful love of my heart will grant to all those who shall receive communion on the first Friday of nine consecutive months, the grace of final repentance. They shall not die under my displeasure, nor without receiving the sacraments. My heart shall be their sure refuge at that last hour. Of course, that includes uh, confession. Make your first Fridays, and while you're at it, make your first Saturdays. Make every effort possible to ensure that your children make their first Fridays and first Saturdays. Even if, heaven forbid, later on, one of those kids goes a little wild, he's not going to get away with it. He's not going to get away with it. Okay, let's review. Each one of us should publicly recognize the kingship of Christ by enthroning an image in the most noble place in our home. Then we should start following the three-point spiritual plan in order to inspire a burning love for the sacred heart. Three points of spiritual plan are in the first place prayer, especially the family rosary. Second place, holy communion is frequently impossible. Third place, penance, paying the price for sinners. Remember Our Lady of Fatima said many sinners go to hell because there's no one to pray and sacrifice for them. We can change that. We should remember that the conversion of a sinner is guaranteed if only the price is paid. How do we pay the price? First, by offering ourselves up at Holy Mass with Christ in the chalice. Secondly, by accepting our daily crosses with a spirit of sacrifice. 
and thirdly, for those who can, by making night adoration in the home for at least one hour a month between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. Now, before we close, there's one more motive for getting serious, very serious about devotion to the Sacred Heart. Some years ago, I had the privilege of going to Cardinal Kung's funeral. Cardinal Paul Shan of Taiwan was preaching, preached in Mandarin and in English, and he departed from his notes and pointed out that Cardinal Kung was not the first man in 1949 that had been asked to become the Bishop of Shanghai. He told us that the first man had turned down the job, and not without reason, because he realized that he would suffer terribly at the hands of the communist tyrants. But he told us when Father Kung was asked to be the bishop, he replied that he would be proud to suffer for Christ. And then as Bishop Kung, he traveled around for the next five years, telling his people that they must have no illusions, that they would be persecuted. He prepared his people for the persecution. And of course, there I was sitting in a church full of people, many of whom had spent years, decades, in communist prison camps for the simple crime of being a Catholic, for crimes like owning a rosary, for crimes like belonging to the Legion of Mary, for crimes like refusing to agree that the Pope was not the head of the Catholic Church. Decades in communist prison camps, sitting right there in the parish with the rest of us. Why are we ending a sermon about the Sacred Heart with a story about Cardinal Kung, a true confessor of the faith? Because it's the gentlest way I can think of to say that each one of us needs to be able to say that he'd be proud to suffer for Christ. We need to be able to say that. Each and every one of us needs to be able to say that. And the only way we're going to be able to say that is by living the message of Fatima, praying our rosary every day, wearing the brown scapular, and turning to the Sacred Heart and following this three-point program and begging Him to increase our love. We have a window of opportunity right now. Our Lord has promised us, if we're devoted to the Sacred Heart, He will console us in all our troubles. He didn't promise we won't have troubles, but that He'll console us in all our troubles. And we're going to have troubles. Let's not have any illusions. We're going to be persecuted. There's no need for panic. We know what to do. He told us beforehand, but we are going to be persecuted. If we're living the devotion of the Sacred Heart, if we're living that devotion, then we'll be ready. And we'll be able to use all that to pay the price for the conversion of many souls. Oh, Jesus.